Welcome back to Grand America Outlaw, guys. Two week, two days in a row, two days in a row with the live stream, and uh, two days in a row with no guest. So this will be our first. Is this coming out this week? No, 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 no. Next week. So this doesn't come out for a whole week. Yeah. Actually, that's a good point because we gotta. We so we should make these not so timely, right? Like this. Yeah. Yeah. That's the other reason we we're going to do like a themed one like this would be because it doesn't have to come out like the live ones. The roundups are kind of like stuff that's happening like right now, maybe more current eventish, right? Everything's current event now, so you know. I know, Actually, but, it is, but this is less so than that. It has to be less so because it's not coming out for a week and a bit on audio, at least. Yeah. I never considered that. Oh, well, it is what it is. I did. Uh, well, it'll be fun because maybe by, that, by then some predictions will be true. So where do you want to start? You want to start? Let's start because we do have the big CBDC stuff to get into. But before we do that, I got uh, a couple things just to, I mean, honestly, to help. Just to uh, or whistle? Yeah, and just I don't know if I got a whole hour and a half. I, I mean, I probably surprised myself. But with the five reports I have to go through, I think I would fall short of the hour and a half. And well, I would rather I would rather go long, you know, than short. But this is uh, interesting because I think this is just from this from uh, yesterday. This is from yesterday. So because my my gal, not my gal, but you know, Christian, Christian Freeland. Oh, okay. Danielle Smith has come out and apologized for the treatment of uh, the unvaccinated folks during the pandemic, saying that we were, in fact, the most um, discriminated group in her lifetime. And I kind of would expect Mo to just to jump on that sort of low hanging fruit, especially now, this much later, you know. You could sort of just, you could say that and with zero repercussions from the vaccinated community. You could just say, hey, yeah, sorry. They're not paying attention anymore. Yeah, sorry. We shouldn't have just freaked out on you guys because most of the vaccinated community probably kind of feels like that too. You know what I mean? They, they, most of them think it got a little weird too. So you're not, my point being, you're just not losing any political ground with that side. You know what I mean? No one's going to be like, oh, fuck. I'm not voting for Scott Moe, because he apologized to unvaccinated people three years later. I'm just, that, that cost him my vote. I, I just don't see it. I feel like it was easy for him to just say sorry here, and he sort of refuses to. During the pandemic, we had a real bullying effect come down the pipe from you for the non-vaccinated. And as we head into an election year, I want to know, do you want to apologize for telling us that no more Mr. Nice Guy and we're going to have to travel to senders to independent testing and so on? Uh, it bruised a lot of people and there's a fair number of us unvaccinated. We're going to head into another pandemic and we want to know how you're going to handle it if we vote you in again. Thank you very Thank much. You. I, I, would, I mean, how is this old dude? That was a good question. Go old dude. Yeah, go old dude. I got my mic on here. I would yep. say that we are going to, if, if we're faced with that again, and I hope that we never are, and I hope none of our descendants ever are. Um, there was one in Saskatchewan, I believe, in 1917 when we had the Spanish flu. Um, there was a number of. He's already deflected. You know, I know. Like, no one asked about the seven Spanish no, flu. No, and. We just say sorry and say you won't do it again. And we obviously all would agree that under that you overreacted to the whole thing. So maybe there's a problem yeah. with your whole, you know, paradigm on decisions it. that were made uh, at that point in time that were uh, equally as challenging and difficult as the decisions. I would say that the people seated in front of you in our caucus uh, were tasked with making as we found our way through the most recent pandemic, um, and we made every effort uh, to find a balance. Uh, we were faced, just for context, uh, what we were faced with at that point in time was about 79 ICU beds in the province and 135 people in them just with COVID. Uh, never mind those that may have had a heart attack or those other 50 or 60 uh, people that... I appreciate that that Danielle Smith just came out and just said, sorry, it'll never happen again, I promise. I mean, 
we still have to hope that you'll keep that promise. But just just saying it, you know, kind of helps a little tiny bit, you know, 1%. Absolutely needed a, an ICU bed as well. And, and that is really the precipitous of where some of the decisions uh, came from, uh, from the people you see in front of you and the decisions ultimately that I, that I communicated. And we made every effort uh, when it came to uh, having uh, proof of test policies in place so that people would not lose their place of employment. We made every effort uh, to accommodate uh, all, uh, but to ensure that we were providing uh, the, the very environment for uh, safe gathering, safe communities in a time when I don't think anyone had a lot of answers. And so what I truly hope coming out of the last pandemic is that we don't have to face those types of questions and that type of a situation again. And that's why you're seeing decisions being made up here that involve an over 10. He spends the next two minutes just gloating about how much money he's put into healthcare. I mean, honestly, it, it is, it is super discouraging because he really does just go to like those, like almost like a Trudeau, you know, yeah. almost like instead of, I'm starting to just respect the Canadian politician a little bit that will just answer the question. When, when the question gets directed to them, they acknowledge that they've been asked a question and directly answer it instead no, of like, not, like this crap. He no can't even... He can't even recognize that he's been asked anything or to apologize, you know, blah, 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 blah. Go fuck yourself, Scott Moe. Anyway, discouraging. I thought Scott Moe was a good guy. You know, I thought you'd, I thought that the tide might have turned over there enough for him to sort of take the same, you know, we've been kind of, Alberta's had your guys' back on the gender stuff. Because you guys were in court and we came in with our evidence to try and help you guys win a court case against some crazy leftist. And I, you know, you'd think you could, he'd take that sort of the same ground that we've taken on this vaccine crap, but he fell short. It's a, uh, it's unfortunate. And then I have, uh, so I, I want you to tell me what, what you think about this. Cause I randomly came across this live. And I'm wondering if you think this was uh, because I the first thing I think when I hear this I think of this as someone who's there's not supposed to be election in Canada for a year and a half so I think of this as someone who's seemingly campaigning and maybe hinting at the fact that he's not going to support the budget so you can add to this before I play this uh, what's her name Lucy Lucy Idlot or Idlot or whatever the the Indian broad from the NDP has denounced the budget publicly. So it would seem very unlikely that she is going to support the budget, which means is she breaking the party lines to denounce and not to support the federal budget? Is she going to vote against her party? Who's supposed to vote in unison on this sort of an issue? Liberal or NDT? NDP. NDP. She so She's an Indian, but she's also an NDP. So she has denounced Indian the budget. Native. Native. Okay. Not a Hindu. I wouldn't call I wouldn't call an East Indian. I'll call him an East Indian if it comes up, just for future reference. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, they uh she's uh I mean we're gonna miss it because I was gonna watch her. She's got like a press conference at 6 30 on the Aboriginal news network it's funny that it's still called that <laughs> and on abo news and uh i was gonna guess she's gonna denounce it and say she's not gonna vote for it so you know if the ndp votes against it there's an election for the record just so people know people who are not really? in Canada, because, well yeah the blocks already come out and said they're voting against it so that's if the block and the ndp vote against it then it's they're done it's an election really wow and everyone just assumes Jugmeat was going to vote for it. But well, now we've got someone who's going to break party lines, it seems like, and vote against it no matter what. So is it better if the party just votes together? I mean, I would argue that his party probably gains a lot more clout or ground or votes in an election by taking a stand, you know, as much as, as, he's, been, as he's been screwing us over for 
four years by about two and a half at least from propping up this government people will still remember him for calling the election you know especially the people uh, that are already kind of ndp they'll just be a reason to support him next time so he's got some reasons to maybe break it um it seems like that one chick like i say lucy Adelout, is not going to vote with the party regardless and there's five NDPs that have come out and said they're not running for re-election when it's over. So whether or not they're going to vote along party lines becomes, you know, sketchy too. But then I see this, which was earlier today, and just tell me when you think about this, because when I did when when I listened to it, it just I was like, oh, this guy's that we're we're voting. This is going to election. And it's because, and I'm not going to play the whole no, thing. I mean, but that- all like ten minutes before this, I was like, this guy is not going to call an election. But then he sort of slipped into some other stuff, started complaining about this and that, and then he came up with this. And so I, I want to put to you that we've got a choice. We've got, you know, there will be an election coming up. I'm not giving away any secrets about when the election is. I don't actually know when it is, but we we have an election coming up at some point, and there's going to be a choice that Canadians have to make. And from what I've heard from people is that they're really fed up. People are feeling really frustrated. They feel like things are getting worse and they want change. They don't think that Trudeau can deal with the problems that they're up against because he hasn't. He's had nine years and they felt like he's not really taking it seriously. And I can tell you, no one's had a closer look at Justin Trudeau and the Liberal government than I have. And I can tell you, they don't act with urgency. They don't understand when workers are struggling, what that's like, what that means, what that feels like. I can tell you, I noticed he took the Rolex off for this. When he goes to the union things, he takes off the Rolex. I do. I understand the struggles. I remember when I was 20 and my kid brother had to come live with me and I took care of him. If you ever have to take care of a teenager, that can be tough. Uh, I remember that he would always, I would always worry about him being hungry. And it was a serious concern for me. I remember having to work multiple minimum wage jobs to put food on the table. And I know what that worry is like. And when workers right now are struggling, it motivates me to try to do something to make things better. But when I see the, the liberals, they just, they don't, they're out of touch. They don't have that same urgency. And so what are the choice? If people are fed up and people are saying that we want change, what is their choice? I put to you, the choice is, there's a guy who hates unions and loves big bosses. There's a guy who wants to cut and gut the services that people need. Or there's another guy who believes fundamentally that every decision we make should be about putting working class people at the heart of it, who's proudly pro-union, will always fight for unions. That's a choice that people have in front of them. And I wanna ask you. And I know B has mentioned this before, you know, a lot of people will try to come to to speak with you and try to get close to unions and during the election. Anyway. I, uh, it seems to me like he's starting a campaign for the prime minister job. Yeah, he's got, that. What's that? I can see that, I guess. Yeah. He's got to, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what, what this Lucy chick says, because it certainly sounds like there's a bunch of NDP that are not going to vote for the budget. But it'll be interesting because up until now they've voted together on everything. The other thing is, like you mentioned before, the Liberal Party seems to be falling apart. I mean, I I think that that would be an opportunity to <clears throat> to kind of like have half half of that. I mean, I know that. I mean, they might already said they think that the Conservatives will run away with it, and then maybe the Liberals will sort of disintegrate a little bit, and and end up half of them will end up sort of with the NDP in some way or something. You know, maybe. I don't even want to say new party or something like that, but it does feel like there needs to be a shift. Like, well, the BC they're, they're party cool. just fell apart. Like the BC Liberal Party literally just fell apart. Like fucking two years ago, three years ago. It's not unprecedented that the party could just collapse. Yeah, what a thing to witness. I mean, they've been in power for something like 120 out of 150 years of our existence. Anyway. Uh, uh, do you want to jump into So what do you think about, uh, your boy, Scott Mo? Yeah, I don't know. I, I just, yeah, they're all the same. I don't even trust Daniel yet. I mean, but she, at least like you said, she's saying the right thing, but other than, other than that, to me, none of them, none of them have any credibility at all to me, except for. She gets a lot more credibility for me because she's passing legislation that's protecting us from the federal government. 
Yeah. So that gets, you know, we've got, we got to see this priority act go through, but we've got the Alberta first act that are, has already like actively protected us from stuff. We've won two battles in court against the federal government for trying to shut down our energy sector. So that to me is kind of putting your money where your, where your mouth is, you know, I can't expect them to just, you know, dissolve the government because that's what I want but I can at least be happy that she's doing those sorts of things and will fucking apologize for the things that her government did. And she, she wasn't part of the government at that time. I mean, that probably does make it a little easier. Right. Yeah. yeah. There might be a hard thing. If he says, if he apologized, he might be on the hook for a lot of negative repercussions. I mean, as a politician, he might have to. Dude, I could apologize my way out of that without even like actually apologizing. I could just start being like, "I yeah, you know, I'm sorry you had to go through that." And yeah, uh, you know, what's the point of that? yeah. Well, it still sounds better than what you said. It still sounds more sincere than than like just deflecting the question into a campaign campaign thing. Like, and admitting that it was like a once in a hundred year pandemic, like. Admitting, yeah, he compared it to the 1917 thing, right? So, like, he, he he there was no acknowledgement of how it was a mess. Well, you know, ethical skeptical has kind of changed my mind on some of that stuff, you know. That there was a bunch more people because what do you say? It's it was 6.6 .6 times more deadly than the flu by every metric. And yeah, I don't really yeah, know but, enough to know yeah, for but, sure. But, yeah, but, he don't, but don't forget, all the stuff that was in place to deal with that wasn't used, right? They, there was no early treatments. There was no, I mean, it was handled wrong to begin with. So does ethical skeptic think that that wouldn't have been the case if they would have followed like real science? I don't know. We had him on the show. Did you ask mm -hmm. him that? I think I did, but I can't remember. What pretty sure. He, I don't know. Pretty sure he would have agreed. I don't think he. Right. <laughs> oh, you'll grab your right. <laughs> no, but I mean, the, don't forget the the the, the, vitamin D, the vitamin D censorship. I mean, there was never any like, hey, get out in the sun, get some fresh air, get some vitamins and minerals. Like, the, none of that was even allowed to be talked about. It was, it was. That's what I'm getting at. Is that could have saved a lot of. I agree with that, but the, the flu doesn't get a huge intervention rate. No, but the other thing is with with they're talking about uh, antibiotics, all that with the flu. And respiratory stuff. Like they did, apparently they you know the, it was the if wrong. You did all that with the flu though? How much could you bring that number down if you were just like super hyperactive when everyone got the flu? Well, I don't know if I believe those flu numbers treatment. anyways. I mean, that might be to sell to sell more flu shots. So what the flu numbers have always been? I think way overblown, anyways the flu death to sell more flu shots. So you think so? Yeah. You think it's just people dying of the flu shot? Maybe, or just people dying of whatever it's comorbidities and stuff. And they call it the flu because they're a little sick. Comorbidities. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I bet you Monica remembers Monica's in the chat. She remembers the, the no agenda guys talking about the flu numbers from way back. I think there's really something to that. Well, then that would just put the COVID numbers at like 60 times. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? That would actually make COVID more deadly. Unless you add in the comorbidities and everything else. But if you're going to apply that at all across the board, then to, if we're applying those to the flu, then it stays at a 6.6 .6 to 1. Doesn't it? Yeah. Maybe. And I'm agreeing with you. I'm the one that said it's a, a synthetic bioweapon, right? Co I believe that it was a bioweapon. So I don't think it was just my terrain and it was in my head. I was I was pretty weirdly sick for a while. You just had the, never get that. You had the pussy on a pedestal. You had the COVID on a pedestal. You were oh, nervous. It was in happened. your head. It was in no, your... it wasn't. Yeah. Because no, I had to it was say... in my head that I would get rid of it with iodine and all kinds of crazy stuff. And I'm it didn't not work. sure it was, dude. When you came home, when you came back to the resort with your bag of goodies, you could tell you were like, you're, I'm beating it. I got this. I got 
this stuff to stick in my nose and this other stuff, and I'm going to OD on on vitamin D. And no, you got nailed. It was just, uh, it was funny. I was worried about you, though. There was a time when me and Kyle Delal thought, thought you might be dead. He walked over your house to check on you. I don't think he answered. And then he came back and he's like, he forgot his phone, so I had to wait for him because uh, I think your sister was looking for you. Oh, right. Yeah, there was a time when I didn't even want to answer my phone. I didn't even answer my, yeah, there was a time when, yeah, I was out of it. <laughs> I mean, it's going to turn out, I think, uh, slight prediction, side prediction, that there's a, I would say the chance that there's a non-zero chance it's going to turn out that this came out of Canada. Because this, this Canadian bio lab in Manitoba was come, remember? Like I sent you that thing today and you remember that it had come up like, you know, six right months. away, like right away. Six months before COVID. It was 2019 or something. And COVID comes out January, February, 2020. In this Winnipeg, I can't remember if it was Winnipeg, it's somewhere in Manitoba, though, anyway. And first it was while well, these guys were just, you know, kind of with the Chinese, not a big deal. And this thing has now escalated to the point that, uh, I mean, well, now that I'm talking about it, I'll, let me just switch over to this. Yeah, yeah, let's just play it. Minister says he was taken aback after learning deadly viruses were shipped from the Winnipeg lab to Wuhan. So, I mean, you can't make this up. And and like I say, the timeline on this, I'm, I'm mostly doing this for the for the YouTube thumbnail later. So just so people. <laughs> uh, so this is March 20. That's the picture of him is March 20. Uh, God, I can't zoom back out now, but that might be all right. That's pretty good, actually. Yeah. After learning that samples of deadly Ebola and Nipah viruses had been sent from Canada's top security lab in Winnipeg to China, Public Safety Minister Dominic LeBlanc said that his reaction was similar to that of an MP who expressed incredulity upon learning of the move. Now, there's still uh, public inquiries going on right now in the House of Commons about this. I'm really concerned about the March 2019 incident where, where the Chinese spies, Ying Chu and Kenny Cheng, were implicated in a shipment of live Ebola and Hanapa viruses on a commercial Air Canada flight. How the hell did that happen? NDP MP Charlie Angus asked during a House of Commons Canada Chinese committee Chinese Canada China committee meeting on April fifteenth. So to do the national mic. God, I got to stop saying so. I listen to all these shows and they say so and it drives me nuts because I know that we do it too. It's like the hardest word yeah. to take out of your vocabulary, the hardest crutch word. The National Microbiology Laboratory in Winnipeg shipped 15 different strains of Nipah and Ebola viruses to the Wuhan Institute of Biology in China on March 31st, 2019. So what would that be like a year before we were locked down and like 10 months before COVID? Yeah. The package was sent from Winnipeg to Toronto and then on to Beijing via commercial Air Canada flight. Ms. Q and Mr. Chang, a married couple, were escorted out of the... You knew they were a couple. I was going to ask if they're a couple. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, they're probably a fake couple, but they're spies. They're Chinese spies. And I'm all in July, while under RCMP investigation, the couple were fired from their positions on January 20th, 2021 for having undisclosed undisclosed ties to Chinese regime entities. So let's scroll down a little more. The Nipah uh, Chinese talent recruitment. I mean, I don't, yeah, okay, let's uh, So the Nipah virus is a smaller virus than SARS-2, the virus causing COVID-19 and is much less transmissible. Dr. Stephen Quay, a Seattle-based physician, told a U.S. Senate subcommittee. Uh, but it is one of the deadliest viruses with a greater than 60% lethality rate and 60 times deadly than SARS-2, more deadly. So it's nice to know that that stuff was was ripping around on a plane. That's <laughs> it. I mean, it's it's crazy. Yeah. I'm telling you, it's going to, the reason that we're not talking about this is because, I mean, why can't, it's going to end up being a COVID virus in there. I'm telling you. 
we're going to end up being responsible for the coof. Weaponized coof? Maybe our coof went there, then they weaponized it, then it went out? I don't know. I mean, there's all the U.S. The U.S. stuff with their... It's too um, much of a the function research and all that, too, with Dazic, I think is his name, and all that stuff. I mean... Is, I isn't it too much to be a coincidence? Uh, I don't know. There's just so much other information about the, the NIH and the U.S. being involved in it. So I don't know. I mean, so coincidence? Um, maybe. I don't know. I mean, I mean, to Wuhan, bro. Maybe it's maybe. Maybe it was also in Winnipeg and it was released there. They, they say that it was around. Remember we had the skeptic on it was around. Oh, I mean, it went on a plane. It was on a commercial flight. Maybe that package got lost. And that's why it was just like rolling around the world. Yeah. Anyway, let's get into digital dollars, shall we? Yeah. How Canadians pay for everyday things is changing. Some are using less cash in favor of other payment methods. To keep up with the changing ways that people pay, the Bank of Canada is exploring a digital Canadian dollar, also known as a central bank digital currency. Simply put, this would be a digital version of cash, but it wouldn't replace cash. It would have the same dollar value and it would be accessible to anyone and everyone. You could use this digital Canadian dollar to buy everyday things, just like you use cash or a bank card, but it would be different. Unlike cash, you wouldn't need to carry multiple bills or change. Like a bank card, it would work for both in-person and online purchases. Similar to banknotes, it could possibly still be used when the internet is not available. How's that? How's that? Just like the cash in your wallet. It can possibly, maybe, somewhat still be possibly, used. Possibly, maybe, right. still be used. <laughs> you, should, you should actually rewind it just to see exactly what he says. Because I was, when I first watched this earlier today, I was like, how can it be used? Like, is there, is there like a, how, how can you use it without the internet, right? Is it, does it have a visible, like, counter on it or something like that? I mean, is this. Can you use or, Bitcoin without the internet? No, I don't think so. How how could you? Maybe, I mean, maybe in, in trying maybe or I could probably on a hard wallet just like tap you money through. How is it going to get like from one to the Like AirDrop, but doesn't AirDrop require Bluetooth? Yeah, Bluetooth would work without the internet. Bluetooth doesn't go over the internet. So that's how they're thinking. Yeah, okay. Let's see what he says again. You could use this digital Canadian dollar to buy everyday things, just like you use cash or a bank card, but it would be different. Unlike cash, you wouldn't need to carry multiple bills or change. Like a bank card, it would work for both in-person and online purchases. Similar to banknotes, it could possibly still be used when the internet is not available. Just like the cash in your wallet, it wouldn't earn interest. But it would be secure and private. Just you like the cash the in your wallet would be worth on a nothing. phone, a card, a computer, or another device. Right. At this point, at the Bank of Canada, we're still studying the possibility of issuing a digital Canadian dollar and how it might work. Wait, we Visit our website go back for far? bills or oh, yeah, to yeah, buy yeah, everyday yeah. could use this digital just like you use what did he say like it wouldn't need to change he said he said possibly like a bank card it would work for both in online purchases similar to banknotes it could possibly still be used when the internet is not available possibly still be used when the internet is not available I was just laughing because it's like, and like, like banknotes in your wallet, it won't get interest, but it'll devalue very quickly though. And if you don't spend them, it'll be worth pretty much half in about five years. I don't even understand what the difference is between just that and, and uh, like what we're doing now. 
Well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about, actually. But, but I mean, people in the chats are talking about this this video that's been going viral, and I, I wondered what you thought about it about the the bank teller asking. I've had the bank ask me questions before, personal questions about stuff, and it is kind of creepy. But I I don't know about that. There's been a couple videos going around about them not allowing, like they need evidence of your three thousand dollar withdrawal. Um. I don't know. I don't. I, there's something about the virality of it that makes me suspect. I just, it's too viral right now for me to think it's real. Like, there's not enough, again, there's not enough context with it. It's just showing a. I've never had trouble pulling money into the bank. I've never pulled out more than like 3,000. Did they ask you what it was for? No, they didn't ask me what it was for. Did you pull it out of the machine or the teller? Teller. The machines probably have. I do notice they've they've lowered all the limits, like the max limits. You know, yet you do. Yeah. Have it's crackhead central. You can't. I'm surprised they put any money in those machines still, dude. When we redid the bank, you can't. Yeah, get I did. I did four grand cash like like fourteen months ago. Uh, uh, yeah, and they didn't ask any questions. It was no problem. Uh, but like where I'm doing the I, the bank machines. I'm surprised they still even have them. Like where I'm redoing that bank downtown, dude. There's people living in the in the like because you can get through the one door, you know. So they wait till someone comes out. Or maybe they have a bank card. I don't know, but somehow they're getting through that first door into the vestibule in the winter and and living in there. <laughs> yeah, I was like, man, I would not want to ever. And it's like this. It's not, it's not on the main drag either. It's like out in the parking lot side. So it's just like, man, people would just get steamrolled coming out of here with cash. But I don't know that. I mean, they just upped our email money transfer, my email money transfer without me asking 10x. So is that pretty much, I mean, I feel like my money's digital already. Well, that's kind of what I was going to ask you when you went through this. That was going to be my big take on this is like for Canada, it's to, it's so different than the States. We really do rely on our debit cards and our tap. I think similar to some European countries, maybe the Scandinavian countries or and or Australia. But well, I think that happens in the States a lot too. It's just no, we, no, we no, have no. a different version of it because we go down there without bank cards at work. Because when I was asking like Laura for cash, she was like, what? Well, cash no i don't have any cash why would i have cash a lot of people still use cash down there and and 20 years ago it was easier to use a debit card 25 years ago i used to go down with a debit card and I, now you, now that the debit doesn't work as good as it used to they want you to use your credit card down there there's probably I something just went to the you, bank machine yeah i know but i'm talking about at the t at the tellers well see i my debit card works too but I don't like the exchange rate as much as yeah. if I just go to the teller. So your interact worked at the tellers? Yeah, it works at, I would say, 90%. But I like having just cash down there because what happens is you find the one where it doesn't. And yeah, then, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, I mean, you always have the credit card, but so stuff, I get up to I need cash anyway. Here's a note from Monica too. It's on this. I went to RBC and went to the teller. I asked for $2,400. She didn't ask questions. She also said she could raise my credit card limit to 13 k Oh yeah, of course. They're just trying to raise that up all the time. I'll do it up and donate it to the show. <laughs> Rack up your credit cards. Send it to the show, guys. Let's get to it. But, you know, so I, you might be right. I don't know. And it probably varies state by state. But uh, I know that that I've definitely talked to some people down there that when I bring up cash, they're like, nah, man, I don't really do cash anymore. It's just tap. Since the tap came out, it, it was a kind of a game changer because even in Canada, I was a cash guy until the tap came out because, you know, I do a lot of drive through, drive through coffee, drive through this. And it's just constantly got to put the card in, put the pin number in is here's the 10, here's a 10, here's a 20, give me my change. But then once the tap came out, and it wasn't even like a conscious decision, but I just like migrated completely away from carrying cash. Or like I keep cash in my vehicles just so I just always have, you know, a hundred bucks or 80 bucks in there, you know, in case something happens, I got some cash. So, you know, you go to the thing and oh shit, I forgot my wallet or their machine's not working. I've always just liked to have some cash in my vehicle. 
Yeah, yeah, totally. There you don't have your wallet and you need gas, something like that. So but uh since the tap came out, you know, I just naturally migrate. I don't need cash because it's faster now for me to use the card than it was to use the cash. So, I mean, is that part of the reason why they're hesitating on the CBDC? Because if you look at, well, I mean, who knows? There could be all kinds of reasons. But if you look at, are you going to show the Royal Bank of Canada's reports and stuff in there? Like, I don't have I, any of the Royal Bank of Canada stuff. I just have the sorry, bank. Not Royal Canada. Bank. Sorry, Bank of Canada. Yeah, it's all the Bank of Canada stuff. Should we? Oh, you know what we forgot to do is the feelings of anger towards federal government at all time high. So there's yeah, Ryan says he's using uh, cards too, and it's probably for the like he says for the exact same reason I do. Once that, because here's the thing, I was just going to cash was quicker than the card. It's always been quicker than the card, quicker, 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 quicker. But then they made the card quicker. To it's the now, dude. I even get pissed because I think I'm only allowed ten. I don't know if it's 10 or 15 taps on my card before it it'll, it won't get work. What? Yeah, it's a limit that I set. I haven't found where I set it, but there's a spot oh. on my RBC or you call them and you can set your A, your tap limit, and how many taps you can do before you have to enter your pin again. Ryan says it's because everybody at the farmer's market or literally anywhere you go has a card reader and for their cell phone. That's probably a really good point. Like now, even like when I was helping my friend with the rest, uh, with his store there, like all he, all they've got is that, uh, what's that app that, um, it's, it reminds me of Spotify, Shopify, the Shopify app on a pad that you could take anywhere and use it. So yeah, it's super, it's super portable now as far as like being a, a retailer goes so yeah then, like now you can think, think it goes right in your iphone and people can tap it yeah yeah so jd also says i did ask td for a bank draft eleven and a half thousand, and they did ask me what it was for well they always ask you what a bank draft for even when it's a lot less than that when i got my no, bank draft i did any other business like i saw that clip of the guy going the around and making check. right a banker that's like a like a cashier's check Maybe, but, but did, did you see the clip of the guy making all those funny answers? Like, oh, this is for my, my girlfriend's BDSM, or this is for um, like just stupid, really crazy, stupid answers. And so what, what is like, they don't seem to be like reacting or making notes about what it's for unless like, unless they're capturing audio of you in there answering the question, would that be possible? Do you think, I mean, what, why would they even care if they're not doing anything about it? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I haven't seen the video and I've never been asked. But yeah. I know when I did a bank draft before, it was kind of like a check and there's a little memo portion. And they asked me what it was for. I, th I think at the time it was for like a damage deposit and a rent or something like that. Yeah. yeah. It used to be a lot. I mean, it seems to me like if anything, it's got easier to get larger sums of cash. Because I do remember a time when it seemed harder to to... Like even when you were moving and you had to say go get four grand, it was seemed trickier than it. No, no, it's they've clamped down on the on the higher level amount, I think, but they just increased my email money transfer limit from one thousand to ten thousand without yeah. asking questions. Yeah. Okay, well let's let's do the angry survey before we get into the, like before it gets into the second half, then we'll get back into the C B D C reports and, and all that. The angry survey? Yeah. I mean, someone should just go try and get some cash out and say, what's it for? None of your goddamn business. I'm, I'm sure that was part of the, the montage that I saw. Well, you, you should have you should have really brought that montage along. I've been trolling <laughs> Elon on X, so I'm expecting to get banned soon. Because he's been posting a lot about free speech lately and how much of a champion of free speech he is. So I just keep posting the screenshot of X denying my appeal for being a rule breaker. And it's like, well, when, what, what are the rules of free speech, Elon? Can you elaborate on what the rules of free speech are? Because I haven't broken any Canadian rules on free speech. Yeah, you speech. did. You're, you're hateful, Darren. You're hateful and you're... So you did break the Canadian rules and that's the problem. That's why you're not it's getting not back. Break the Canadian rules. What? 
Canadian political speech against politicians is the most protected speech in Canada by freedom of expression. Oh, you still can't be hate speech. No, if I say the N word or call them a faggot, that's hate speech. Uh, you said. We now that you could talk about this other law that's not in that we went through the bill of C63, but that is not a law yet. It's but right big. now, we're going on existing laws. Exactly. And I was kicked off a year ago before that bill was even talked about. So I've been kicked off of Twitter for, you know, exercising the most amount. And I have a harder and harder time believing that Rachel Notley has that kind of pull. Yeah, there is that. But I think all the potential and current or past premiers have that kind of pull. She just reaches that stage. If you're a potential or, or have been, that you'll have that you pull. Think, you think so? Yeah. When I look at the stuff that people say to Trudeau. Oh, no. It's I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. It's way worse now. But for some reason, like you slid into that thing where it was hateful. And then shadow banning. X is back to shadow being. Yeah. That's the rumor. Uh, Tesla stock down 40%. Yeah, see, that's... Oh, sorry. I was just going to read... Uh, were you reading that? I was just going to read Curb Creeper. I took out 2K and was asked what it was for, and I answered hookers and blow. She smiled, but then said, that's not funny, sir. <laughs> Good job, Chase. <laughs> I uh, Okay, so feelings of anger towards the federal government hit... New high. Satisfaction reaches all-time low. I don't know what this chart means, but it looks angry. <laughs> looks so angry. Here we have, and this is, I guess it's 100% tall, and this is sort of since November to March. So well, the we red would be angry. 23% anger to a 19% optimism rate with a lot of pessimism in between. So, well, wow. But if you come up to now, both the pessimism and the anger have grown so 31 percent each so i have a 62 percent there did you did i send you the clip or did you see the clip of my story on instagram of elon no. talking about baiting ducks no it's a it's a deep fake but it's pretty funny he's like if you put corn in your duck decoy spread you have a thousand percent better odds <laughs> the deep fakes are getting pretty good if they're short like that they can get you. If they're long, it's harder. Uh, feelings towards the federal government, 31% angry, 31% pessimistic, 6% unsure, disinterested, 11% satisfied, uh, 11%, and 10% optimism. Feelings of anger toward the federal government have increased or held steady in every region with the largest increases among residents of Quebec and Atlantic Canada which was kind of a surprise to me. But I guess it's because the West always hates Ottawa. So they just hate them a little more. It's harder to measure that. Actually, that's pretty telling what you're saying here because that's, you know, those are usually the ones that support it, right? So if, if you've got your supportive provinces turning on you, then that's that's trouble. Well, Quebec has always been about 50-50, 50% liberal and 50% separatist. It's actually probably down to more like 20% or 25% separatist now, which is still... Honestly, what the block seems to be to me. But Latin Canada, definitely historically uh, voting liberal. I mean, they've got a bunch of charts just on anchor. And if I went through this whole thing because I figured there'd be a little more substance to it. But it's really just it's just about the anger ratio. So the overall is 31% uh, anger. Quebec is 24%. Ontario, 28%. And the prairies, 44%. Oh, yeah, yeah. Almost half of us hate Trudeau, which is kind of the the uh, the the flavor I get out there. So this is by age, you know, the average sort of right across the board from your 18s all the way up. They're all hovering around 30, 31 percent. Now, this one's by gender. Males, males hate the government more, a lot more than females. This, this probably has almost not quite double, probably by an extra 50 percent which probably goes along with the uh, gender diversion we're talking about. Yeah. 
Uh, so this is Nanos too. I mean, Nanos is one of our main sort of polling companies in Canada. It's not like some internet bull crap. I mean, it is. It's all internet bull crap now. But Nanos is like uh, one of the ones you can sort of watch when there's an election coming and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, that's the survey on how much people are angry with the government. Do you want to start with your buddies over at McKinsey and Co? <laughs> well, I, I thought we were going into the digital dollar and the CBDCs and stuff. Yeah, yeah, this is. Okay, okay, sure, sure. This is uh, uh, consultants. McKinsey and Company, the number one uh, consultants in Canada, $20 billion a year. I don't think they get the whole $20 billion, but they get a chunk of it. CBDCs are digital currencies issued by central banks. Their value is linked to the issuing country's official currency. So when I say that, is it really sound, it's starting to seem more like CBDCs are just like my email transfers. What is the fucking difference here? What is the difference? Okay, well, since I don't have cash and it's linked to the same cash, okay. and I can use it like my debit card or on the internet wow. or I can turn it into cash. What is the difference? Oh, can I explain the difference to you then? It seems I'll, to be the way the internet's heading already. Can I explain the difference to you then? In video? Sure. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take over your thing for a second. Here's the difference. Because you you're on to the same track I was going. You ready? I don't know. I guess this is how much I owe the IRS. What the Freeze! Put your hands where I can see them! Happy Dex Day. Have you reported your Venmo transactions? No. Why would I do that? We have to do that now in the States. I didn't know Venmo that. Over 600 is reported. So we can get more of your money. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Agent Smith with IRS. Do you have any ID? Uh, no, I don't. But I do have a gun, which should answer a lot of your questions. IRS? Why are you armed? Oh, that's because we used your money to buy ourselves weapons to use against you. But only if we have to. That doesn't- Also brought some of the millions of rounds of ammunition that we used your money to buy for us to use on you. <laughs> Hope it's not needed. What do you want from me? Gonna need you to redo your taxes, including your Venmo transactions this time, sport. Um, okay, do I have to like enter my friends pay me back for dinner? Yeah, I'd put that in just in case. Also, have you bought any crypto? Yes. Have you sold any of your crypto? So what's the difference? <laughs> well, they want they want to. So my, I was going down the same track as you on this whole thing. It's they like, got your why? Venmo now. They got your Venmo now. Canada doesn't. They can they, if they want. That's what. That's they my. They do. Point. They do. Canada does. Canada what? does. We we're in. We were pre. We were pre. If you want to start an account now, you are not starting a business account for the payment provider in question, which I'm not even going to get into too much here because we're in the loophole zone. But if you do that now, you have to fill in your um, SIN number and everything. I looked at doing it again now, and it was like, whoop, no, no, that's changed. I think nowadays that that's getting reported. So oh, that even right. like we we were in the wild west of that even, you know what I mean, getting that thing made. I don't know for sure, but well that's kind of where I was going with it is why don't they change instead of creating a CBDC cuz it's almost all online anyway. It's just just complete that process of and I'm not active activating for this at all. Like I'm not pushing for this at all, but you would think the government, instead of going to a, instead of crashing the economy and making us completely broke so they can come in with their CBDCs and save us all, why don't as they just. As a new currency. As a new well, currency. Yeah, that has value again. It's a digital dollar. Instead of, instead of in, making up a digital dollar, why don't they just finish off the infrastructure of the digital payment system that we're all like 80% of the way there already. Right. Like, but they just probably, they're probably missing these, these transactions and they don't have authority to go into the transactional level. Right. So 
wouldn't 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 they be able to just create fucking stealthy laws and stuff that they can actually start tracking things differently? I mean, wouldn't that be easier Why than they, just do that now, though? they could easily just do that now if they can to make laws to say what I can post on social media. You can't think they can make a law that says PayPal has to disclose every transaction. Venmo has to disclose every transaction. I mean, Coinbase is doing it now. Maybe even wire transfers, maybe right even e transfers and stuff, right? Yeah, I have to like jump through the hoops on Coinbase just to keep using it. And dude, they're reporting, dude. If you would transfer anything over a, over a thousand dollars on Coinbase, they're telling the government about it straight up. All right, so they're further along than I thought on that, I guess. Yeah, that's why. And it says it's the the crazy thing to me is it just says it's linked with the cash. So what's it's the, not what, linked what's to the cash? Thing? It's the same value as the cash, is what they're saying. So it's like yeah, you, you it's the thing it said that you could still use your cash. The video we just watched said you could still use no. your cash. Um, hmm, I don't think that's what it said, but. Should we watch it again? It said just like cash. It didn't say you can still use your cash. No, I'm sure. If it didn't say it there, then it definitely says it in one of the reports that I'm about to read. Okay. Yeah, that's 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 fine. That's what, but, but, like, what the hell are we doing then? I really don't see what okay, the difference. All, can I can I explain it then while you while we're talking about it? It's it's gonna be about controlling our purchases then right which you which you can't which they can't do right now like they can track it after the fact but they can't stop us from buying with the digital dollar that we have access like from buying meat or from like listen listen to this guy here i mean this is how this is where it's gonna go and this is why i guess they need to take it to this next level right and the one final note i will uh make is that if you think about the benefits of digital money, there are huge potential gains. It's not just about uh, digital forms of physical currency. You can have programmability, you know, um, units of central bank currency with expiry dates. You could have, as I argue in my book, a potentially better, and yeah, some people might see it, or a darker world where the government decides that units of central bank money can be used to purchase some things, but not other things that it deems less desirable, like say ammunition or drugs or pornography or something of the sort. And that is very powerful in terms of the use of a CBDC. So yeah, that's, I mean, all these guys at the, that's at the WEF, the World Economic Forum there. This guy wrote a book about it, must be a big seller. That's WEF, I can still get cash though. Cause I'm just gonna get cash for my porn. Yeah, or it's cash. Like it's like I do right now. It's going to create a whole underground economy, basically. But it well, won't even be underground because then they can just take that cash and turn it into CBDC. That's really what I just I just don't understand. What the difference is it just maybe on currency exchange? Let's watch this again. It's a minute long. How Canadians pay for everyday things is changing. Some are using less cash in favor of other payment methods. To keep up with the changing ways that people pay, the Bank of Canada is exploring a digital Canadian dollar, also known as a central bank digital currency. Simply put, this would be a digital version of cash, but it wouldn't replace cash. It would have the same dollar value and it would be accessible to anyone and everyone. You could use this. Wouldn't replace cash and would have the same value as cash. So maybe it's just to get everybody in the digital ID then. Just I mean, get you started, just to get you warmed up, so that, to get can, into so that they can change it later. Get the get the CBDC in now, so that they can phase out the cash later in a generation or yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, not even a generation probably, because there is stuff like this that that they want. I mean, the ID's got to come first, right? No digital ID, no payment. This is how they get people to comply so much for being optional because you're going to have this like a cost of living payment for your primary age kindergarten student and $250 for secondary students is now available to, to parents and carers with applications closing in, Mar in June 2024. And then you have to get it, connect digital identity to create your Commonwealth statutory declaration online. So I already have that ID. to do my yeah. taxes. 
So, so I don't need CBDCs for that. They've they've got me already. I already have a digital ID for Alberta and for and for Canada. Huh. Yeah, and for health probably too, and for Alberta yeah, health too. And for health, like we were talking about last show, I can go to the doctor anywhere in Canada and they'll pull out my phone. No, 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 no. I don't think so. I think it's provincial. I don't think it's connected. It's they don't con have the pan-Canadian system, I don't think. That's the problem. That's what they, they wanted to implement. What? I think they do, because I've um, gone to the doctor in, in Ontario. And they know about all my same stuff. Maybe I had to sign something. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. That's interesting. I, I've I've had problems just between Saskatchewan and Alberta before. So you're going to the doctor already? Not me personally. Just dealing with people that need the doctors all the time. Like, all right. Should we switch to plus? Yeah. All right. You want to shut down the streams? Sure. When was the last time you paid for something with cold, hard cash? Well, physical currency is still widely used all around the world. People in some countries have been using it a lot less lately, especially during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic with its cash shortages and hygiene concerns. Did that? Uh, I remember the hygiene concerns. I don't remember shortages. A variety of recent... Digital disruptions, including the emergencies of cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology, have made waves in the financial services sector. Digital currencies are part of that story, and central banks have started to take note. Uh, 